No. Okay. There. I think we're all set up. So I know what I'm doing. I am letting you know that I updated grades this morning. So if you finished homework four, you should be able to see how you did. If anyone thinks that there is a mistake in the answer key, please let me know because that is entirely possible. So as an example, Nathan sent me an email saying my p-value is 0.049. Should I call that significant or not? And I looked in the database and sure enough, in SAS and in Stata, it was returned as p equals 0.050 which is just enough to make it count as non-significant, whereas his would have been significant. And when I saw that, I went, shit, here's going to be a bunch more errors that I have to correct. So if that happened to you, where, it, where something was right on the borderline and you answered one way based on your output, but the database had something different, please let me know, and I will fix it and give you your point back. Um, if at any point you think there's an answer key issue in the database, please let me know that, because it's entirely possible. I am not perfect, as it turns out. I know. Shocker. I'm human and I make mistakes. So let me know if I have made one and I will be very grateful to have it fixed. Uh, otherwise, uh, the next thing that you have to work on is a formative assessment, which is available to you. And that is gonna be due Monday night as usual. I am working on your next homework. I started it this morning. I have to solve a degrees, of, denominator degrees of freedom discrepancy across programs. Once I do that, I will let you know when it is ready. Um, I did decide to push it back two days, though, in terms of when it's due on the syllabus, just in case we need one more class to get through the material that goes with it. So it won't be due for two weeks from tomorrow is when, when it will be due instead. So I will let you know when that is available. Otherwise, I think that's all of the announcements slash logistics things I had in my working memory. Any questions or anything I might be forgetting? So I have a quick question about interaction terms because I just, it's so fuzzy in my brain. I just want to put it to rest. So okay. if you have, you know, in, this, in, in the format of like uh, main effect colon main effect to define the interaction terms, um, does the interaction term apply to the first, the, to before the colon or after the colon? When it applies to both. Maybe things better or worse. It, it applies to both. So any, okay. any interpretation, or let me back up. Any interaction between two variables has two possible and equally valid interpretations. Okay. So if I have two predictors, X and Z, and I give them main effects, so I give a slope to them individually, and then I also put in their interaction, I can either talk about the coefficient for the interaction as what happens to the slope of X per unit Z, or I can talk about it as what happens to the slope of Z per unit X. They are both correct. Okay. And so in homework four, I was looking to reinforce that point by asking you about the same interaction from two different perspectives. How does full-time work moderate the effects of food school? And how does food school moderate the effects of full-time work? So there were a few uh, instances in which the interaction term was the answer to, like, to multiple questions because it was coming from it from a different perspective. Uh, so, well, I don't want to give anything away because I, anyway, that makes, that makes more sense. So, like, if it adds, so food school was, or um, both work was negative, a negative slope, and so if the interaction term was negative, then it was making it more harmful. Yes, if, if the interaction okay. term was, was negative and the slope is negative, that's a more negative strengthening of the effect. And in this context, okay. it's, it's harmful because you want children to try more foods. So the, the harmful or helpful depends on the context of the outcome and whether higher scores are a good thing or a bad thing. Okay. So like in the golf homework, higher scores are a bad thing. Um, in counts of new foods, higher scores are a good thing. And in the next homework that you have to work on, there will be more practice with interaction terms and linear model ideas. And generally speaking, like I have a pattern to the questions, like effect for one group, effect for another group, and then difference in the effect. And I word them that way on purpose, because if you got the first two right, you can find the difference between those two effects by literally subtracting one line of code from the other. And so what makes those two lines different will create the difference between the two slopes. And most of the time, that's going to be an interaction term, possibly a combination of interaction terms.
An interaction always represents a difference in slopes. How often do you see like a three-way interaction? In uh, it depends on what class I'm teaching. Okay. So in a class like this, not very often, but in longitudinal, for instance, let's say that we have a quadratic pattern of change where you have like a slope that levels off or something and you model that with linear and quadratic time and you want to answer the question as to whether the pattern of change differs between two groups. Well, that's a group by time and group by time squared set of interaction terms to answer that question. That's a three-way interaction. So in that context, you can either talk about how the quadratic time slope changes across groups or how the effect of time varies, or wait, the other way around, how the effect of group changes over time. All right, other questions, things you wanna talk about? No, okay. Then how about we head back to lecture five? Sound like a plan? Okay. Are we doing okay? I'm feeling like the energy in here is like not, not great today. Is it just garbage day? Has garbage day got you down? No? Some, some energy is good? Yep. Well, there's not snow, so there's that. I'm, I'm back to going to work in short sleeves, so that's progress, right? I think so. Well, we get to do multivariate models. Those are fun. Yeah. Like, like in a nerdy kind of way, they're fun. I think so. So let's see. I think we made it like four slides in last time, um, which is not very far. So we can start back where we, we left off with that. So terminology, first off, um, the addition to this unit in terms of new concepts is the idea of different strategies for modeling dependency. When you hear the word dependency, what synonym should immediately come to, to mind? And feel free to read from the slide. Correlation. Yeah, correlation. Yeah, the idea of correlated residuals. Data collected from the same sampling unit is going to have a relationship. That's just always what happens. And so the question is, how do we allow that relationship to exist in the model so that it matches what is actually happening in the data? And that type of dependency can be considered as a nuisance. So if you're thinking of your study as pertaining to individual level people and different characteristics and phenomenon for people, but the only way that you could get enough people is to grab them from different units. So you went to multiple schools or multiple hospitals or multiple something so you could get enough people. In that case, the dependency that is introduced by sampling multiple units, hospital, schools, et cetera, is a nuisance, like you don't really care about it, it's just something you have to deal with or address. That's different than these sorts of situations that I'm focusing on in this unit where dependency is the point. You are collecting multiple outcomes from the same person on purpose so that you can look at differences and how that person reacts to, in their different conditions, different occasions, different items. Or you might be collecting multiple outcomes from the same um, natural grouping, so families, for instance, or dyadic data, and multiple people from the same group more generally is known as cluster data. So in those cases, dependency is not just a problem to be solved, it's, it's, a, it's a valuable facet of the analysis. In this class, what we're focusing on is a multivariate structure that I would call balanced, meaning that the same possible outcomes are observed for all sampling units. It doesn't have to be complete, but the same possible has to be observed. So like if I have repeated measures, conditions A, B, and C, that's balanced because everybody has the same possible three. Somebody could be missing C and only give me A and B, and that's okay. But what's not okay is if each person had a completely different set of observations. Um, that type of structure is, would be best addressed using multi-level models, which is a different class. And so that's what I could refer to as unbalanced. So an example of the latter, let's say that you're doing research on childhood memories and you ask each subject to come up with 10 times that you, your parents were mad at you or something like that. Well, you can think of those 10 instances as repeated observations on the same person, but people aren't going to come up with the same stories. 
So each person really has their own discrete set of outcomes. I would call that unbalanced data in SNP. So any questions on those vocabulary or concepts? Okay. Then, why would we do this and how would we do this is the next set of questions here. So there's, there's two ways that you can estimate multivariate models like this. One is by tricking what I call univariate software. So that's the type of software that we've been using up to this point where you have one column in your data set for the outcome. You can actually trick software into doing multivariate models that way by rearranging the data so that all outcomes are pertained in the same column. So I will show you how to do that. Um, it's known as stacking the data or restructuring or reshaping from a wide format to a long format. So this would be useful as a strategy if what you're interested in are mean differences across repeated conditions. So if you want to know if people do better when they're in condition A than condition B, then A versus B is conceptually a predictor, even though it's a difference in outcome, and you can estimate a linear model looking at differences as a function of that predictor, as well as interaction terms. Um, another situation is if you're interested in whether the effect of a predictor differs across outcomes. So if you're doing, say, an intervention design, you want to know if your intervention improves reading comprehension more than it does reading speed, something like that. Then you could put both outcomes onto the same scale, look at whether the slope for intervention has a bigger effect size on one versus the other. Um, a problem with this type of trick setup, though, is that it really works best for data where the conditional distribution can be specified as multivariate normal and data in which the conditional distribution doesn't have any additional variance related terms. So like multivariate binary data would be fine for this. Uh, where you start to run into problems are models for like counts and binomials and stuff where you need extra stretchy factors. These types of strategies force all of the outcomes to share a common stretchy which is problematic in most cases. As well as they, they share uh, intercepts for the submodels as well. So then the other option, which we will get to as the last unit in this class, is path analysis. In that case, it's like you're estimating multiple regression models simultaneously, and you can specify each one to have a different link function as needed. Options vary by software, of course. So this is appropriate when you have generalized models. It's appropriate whenever you're thinking about a given variable as both an outcome or a predictor, such as in mediation. And generally speaking, I think it's easier for people to wrap their heads around a path model. So I have lots of examples of that, and that's something that we can do in all packages, including M+. So if you haven't done so already, at your nearest convenience, please make sure that in virtual desktop you have access to M+. I am going to be using M plus to teach structural equation models in the fall. So this is your chance to get a head start in learning it along with the Levon. But Levon can't do everything that M plus can do. I know, it's crazy, right? Uh, the big difference in terms of traditional multivariate analysis is that everything that we're going to do is going to use likelihood estimation instead of ordinary least squares. And that switch in estimation strategy allows us to have incomplete outcomes. So not everybody has to have every outcome for their data to be included in the model, whereas they do if you're using, if you're doing traditional MANOVA or traditional, um, yeah, that kind of stuff, what's called multivariate statistics. So I think that's where we ended up last time. Any questions on any of that before we do some new stuff? Go for it. Uh, I know I asked this a million times, but um, can you explain balanced versus unbalanced again? My use of the term, yeah. specifically, because I can't claim that everyone uses it the same way, is if there is a common set of possible types of outcomes, it's balanced, and if not, it's unbalanced. Um, okay. So, uh, let's say that I set your phone to make you answer questions four times a day. If I asked you a question at 10 o'clock in the morning, a question at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and another question at, three, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, right? Everybody has those times. That's balance. 
But if I did something like when you wake up, after lunch, before dinner, even though everybody has three observations, they're not going to be at the same time. And so the distance between them matters. Because if you think about observations that are closer together in time being more related, then it matters if you woke up at 11 and had lunch at 12 yeah. versus if you woke up at 6 and had lunch at 1. Okay. So that's, that's an instance with respect to time. Um, another type of instance would be like, like by the, the memories example, right? If I get, said, come up with 10 memories and answer questions about them, your 10 memories are not going to be like anyone else's 10 memories. Okay. So um, software-wise, if I'm thinking, if each column represents a variable, mm -hmm. then every person has some value in each column, right? Uh, they don't have to have all complete data, but they would have, like, the name of the column would be the same for everybody, is maybe the way to think about it. Ah, okay. So they can be missing. They, they can be had missing outcomes as long as you're in likelihood estimation. They cannot if you're using ordinary least squares based on sums of squares because you have to have compute, complete data to compute a sum of something and have it mean the same thing across observations. Okay. Um, another instance would be if I have uh, children's data from multiple classrooms, if not every classroom has the same possible number of kids. And even if they did, like what is child one in the first class is not the same kid as it is child one in someone else's class. So, like, there's a different possible sets of children represented across the samples of classrooms. And so that's different than if you're saying, like, for instance, in dyadic data, I might be studying, like, cancer patients and their caregivers, right? Like, those are, like, you can name the columns that, and that means the same thing. It's not the same as if I had child one, child two, child three, because across schools, it's a different kid. So anything that's unbalanced, that's really where multi-level models with random effects are best suited to be, be able to model patterns of dependency. Um, I would say as a general set of labels, multi-level models, meaning models that have fixed and random effects, are a strategy for addressing multivariate sampling situations. They're not the only strategy, though. So I want to give you the other one to start with because it's actually simpler. Okay, good questions. And don't apologize for asking the same question. I'll probably give you a slightly different answer each time, so this is like converging evidence. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Terminology? Situations when you might care about this? Okay. Then away we go. Slide five. So there's two primary strategies for introducing dependency into your model to best match your data, directly or indirectly. So directly is only possible for models that have conditionally normal residuals. Basically models where there is a separately estimated residual variance for each outcome because then there can be separately estimated residual covariances. And the way that we introduce correlation among the residuals is literally to tell the software, let these outcomes within a person have a correlation structure. We just let it happen. So rather than assuming independent observations, the model assumes whatever correlation it estimated between each pair of outcomes. So we'll talk about that one first. Indirectly is by using random effects instead. And this is really the only option for generalized models because they don't have a separately estimated residual variance. And if you don't have a separate residual variance, you can't have residual covariance as a thing. So this way gets used in unbalanced data, and it also gets used in generalized models with balanced data. And I will show you options um, for all these different combinations. So Half models, I think, is where we're going to end up doing this one more, uh, more readily. So what, talking about the first one then to start with, how do we talk about what the model looks like and what it predicts directly versus indirectly? We have to do a little bit of notation stuff to talk about that. So if I just write the model this way, like I'm, this is what is known as scalar notation. This is the way that I tend to think about models. I don't think in matrices. But when I look at it this way, 
it's not immediately obvious what we're saying about the E's with respect to their covariability. There's nothing in this that tells me that. So there's a different way of writing the model that tells that more directly. So we have to switch to matrices. Dun, dun, dun. I don't like them, but do you know why I don't like them? I'll tell you. Because if you just show me this much, I don't know what's in it. I don't know which X's are there. I don't know how many fixed effects I need. Like, like the details are hidden. So as compact as this is to describe a whole system of equations, it's not very informative. You only really know what goes into this once you start to break it down in this kind of fashion. So I don't think this way. Uh, what about that? That's nice, though. Hmm? The expanded version? The expanded version. Yeah, this is how I think. Yeah. But, but this is functionally just like six equations. That's the way that I, I think of it. So other people think like this. If you talk to Jonathan, he thinks like this. He would look at this slide and say, words, words, words. Where is it? Oh, here it is. Oh, got it. And that would be enough. My brain does not work that way. So this is an example for six people, each with one outcome. So, so where we are right now, univariate type of designs, independent residuals. So I have the Ys for six people. I have my X matrix, which um, is often called a design matrix in this context. It is the predictors that have fixed effects go in X. So I have fixed intercept represented with a column of ones here, and then I have a predictor X. So in this case, we're going to pretend like X is binary. It's just a, a grouping variable. So I have my X's here, and then I have my two fixed effects. So this is a very, con and then I have my E's. So this is a complicated way of describing a two-sample t-test, <laughs> right? Independent observations, two groups as a predictor of a conditionally normal outcome. That's otherwise known as a uh, two-group t-test or two-sample t-test. So across all six people then, if I were to put together the residual variance and covariance matrix that goes with these E's here, it would have this type of structure. Uh, this goes by several different names. Um, in SAS, this is recalled VC, which stands for variance components. Um, it's also known as independent in certain structures. And because this is all the same, um, sometimes it's identity, meaning that like you just basically, it's a constant multiplied by this if you stick ones on the diagonal. But the key idea is what's happening in these off diagonals. They're all zeros here. Because according to this type of model, the E's are independent across people, so they don't have any kind of relationship. And the model also says that the residual variance of these E's is constant. So that's why it's the same variance on the diagonal. So the first time that I saw this type of notation, I was immediately confused because this is for one person, and yet there's a variance across people here. So that always tripped me up, but the only way that this is estimable is if at least some people share a common variance, because it has to be multiple observations to make a variance in the first place. So this is describing the idea of constant variance on the diagonal and no residual covariance whatsoever, which is appropriate if you have only one observation per person. So then we switch it to look a little bit different if we have multiple observations per person. Okay, so with me so far. All right, by the way, this idea of a column of ones for where the intercept goes, that's going to become a lot more salient when we get to multivariate models. Because what we're going to do to trick univariate software is shut this thing off. And we're going to make it so that each DV gets its own column of zeros and ones for whether it's that DV. So this will be a, an important thing to focus on in terms of how to set up your model because it changes what everything else means whether this is here or not. So this is, uh, this is regular flavor GLM, right? This is regular flavor GLM. Uh, also, can I make a quick comment? Yeah. On this, so matrix notation, uh, it used to trip me up too, and um, I'd like, uh, so if anybody else is having trouble too, I'd say for me what helped is uh, I think of uh, with that XB thing, because mm -hmm. I know we're going to see a lot of this later on with the, uh, when you get into the other ones. 
the other models, right? So what I think is like first column goes with first entry of the B, second mm -hmm. column goes with second entry of the B. Yeah, I just exactly. like draw lines with them and then combine them later. Yeah, so the, know, this goes with beta else. zero, and yeah, and this goes with beta one. Yeah. So when you do the multiplication, it works out down here. Yeah. And and yes, we will we will see some matrix notation, but honestly, not a lot because it's not. I, I don't find it helpful. Okay. It 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 is helpful when you're introducing how the model for the variance has to change to become multivariate, because this scalar equation does not tell you anything about what you're doing with the e's. Okay, so yes, this is regular flavor GLM. And do you remember this idea of height? So the goal of maximum likelihood estimation or residual maximum likelihood, which is where we're heading back to, is to find the parameter estimates that make the data combine the tallest across people. So in the context of one observation per person, we have basically the univariate normal probability density function gives us the height. So we plug in the model estimates for the residual variance, and once we have that, then the solution for how we get the betas that create y hat just falls out. It's a matrix uh, product that we don't have to find the fixed effects, they just fall out once you have the variances. X transpose X inverse, X transpose Y, for those of you keeping score. One of the very few things I have uh, memorized. And you plug in that information to a function and you get a number for each person. That number, if you take the natural log of it, then allows you to add the numbers across people rather than multiply. And the sum of those individual log likelihoods is the model log likelihood. Where bigger is better, if we multiply it by minus 2, then smaller is better. And... A uh, comment from the audience, the variance covariance makes sense to me, but the matrices are always a stretch. Agreed. They're a stretch to me, too. But the key idea I'm trying to get to here is that there is a number that pops out for each person. And the goal is to make the set of, of these log likelihoods across people the tallest. So I did this on, like, the first day of class, maybe the second, in Excel. If you plug in the, um, the data into the norm dist function in Excel, you can get the same log likelihood that SAS or Stata or any program would generate for you. So how this has to switch then is transitioning. Let me see here. Yep, that's coming. Where did that slide go? Hang on. Did I lose a slide? No, it's coming. All right. All right. I knew where I was going with this. I just had it in the wrong order in my head. So to go from univariate to multivariate then, if we are using univariate software to do this, we have to change the structure of our data to be able to use it. So if you have a traditional data structure in which it's one row per person, so person here is my sampling unit, is the way that I'm thinking about it, but you could be studying schools or planets or countries or whatever, and it would be one per. So this type of structure is known as wide. It's also known as multivariate to me because this is the type, this means that we would have uh, the capacity to do multivariate models and multivariate software. So this is an example where I have a time one occasion and a time two occasion in separate columns. So conceptually, it's still the same idea where X is a grouping variable, but in this case, X is time. And it's repeated measures as opposed to independent samples. So the wide structure looks like this. What we have to do is transform it into a structure that looks like this long one on the right. So I call this stacking the data. That's a very common expression. Um, going wide to long is also what you would search for in most of the documentation for, say, uh, M plus, SPSS, Stata. They all use that same terminology of wide to long or long to wide. Conceptually, what is happening is that each person's data is being individually transposed, row by row. So we take the two columns, stack them into one. Two columns, stack them into one. So any information that is person level, such as their ID variable, gets repeated across the rows. And we have to come up with a new predictor, at a minimum one, but probably two, based on where they go into the syntax, to keep track of which outcome this single column Y is pertaining to. So this is now the long structure is one row 
per outcome per person. So in this case, each person has two rows of data because they have a time one and a time two outcome. So I have my original X here that would be considered, uh, that would probably go into the model to differentiate which occasion is which, centered so that time one is, the, is zero. And then I have a different version of it that goes elsewhere in the code as an identification variable. So these two columns serve different purposes, which is why we're going to end up with both of them. So the command for this um, is called reshape, for instance, in, in Stata. I think it's called long to wide and wide to long in M+. Um, every software package, even SPSS, can do this for you. So I've had students try to do this type of restructuring manually, like in Excel or something. Do not. Do not. It's like four lines of code. The other thing that I have people do is when they know that they need this type of structure and they're hand entering data, they will go to the trouble to like enter, enter all of this duplicate information like for person and paste it down the rows. Don't do that either. So if you have a data effort in which you have person level information in one file and let's say that you have this kind of multivariate lo uh, long information in another, you can easily merge those two files together. So if you merge in a person file, its information will be pasted all the way across the columns for that person like it needs to be. So I know that this looks like it, there's a redundancy here, but there's not. The data have to be complete to be used. And so we have to know which person it is for each row. We have to know which occasion it is for each row and so forth. Okay. With me so far? Yeah. Question? Yeah. What is the role of X in this case? Can you repeat it? X is going to go into the model as a fixed effect. Why? Y is going to be the outcome. <laughs> or WHY. So we have tricked the software into still having one column that we're calling Y, but Y contains multiple outcomes simultaneously. X and time are both used to say which Y goes with which, ops, which outcome, but they're used in different places in the syntax. So X is going to be used as a fixed effect to keep track of whether we're predicting time one or time two. Time is actually going to be used as an ID variable to structure the matrix of residual variances and covariances. So they are redundant, but they're used in different ways. Right. Yep. And uh, you said you need complete data for the long structure, right? Yeah, that is, I think that's like five slides from now. But yes, that's, that's the dirty secret about how these, these uh, models handle missing data. They don't. Uh -huh. so, okay. so complete as in, <laughs> complete as in no missing. Every row has to be complete to be in the model. Yeah. So what that's going to mean is that, let's say that this first person didn't come back at time two. I get to use their time one data. Oh. But if they don't have a time two outcome, I can't use this row for them. But that also means that if this person, if I have um, a covariate that's person level, and they didn't answer that question, then that variable is going to be missing at time one and time two, and I can't use them at all. So, one person has multiple measurements, and if one of their measurements is missing, we can still use that person's other, other measurements. Yes, we can use whichever of their rows are complete. Right. Uh, yep. Okay. Yeah. So, in, in least squares land, like, because the data are structured this way, this person would be kicked out of the analysis if they're missing either outcome. Oh, okay. We get to keep the one that they do have, because it's still each row is complete, but a row is a lower level of sampling. So uh, does the white structure also apply to repeated measures in OVA? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, repeated measures in OVA is a special case of these models, but when people use that word, what they're talking about is least squares. So there's nothing wrong with ANOVA. The problem is least squares estimation with respect to missing data. Okay. Um, had a question. Are we saying we need wide structure for multivariate or the other way around? <laughs> yes. Here's why this is confusing. If I set up a path model, I need the wide structure on the left. If I try to estimate the exact same model by tricking univariate software, like a longitudinal model would look like this way, then I need this, the structure on the right. So they're, they're both used for different purposes. 
the, the structure on the right here, this long structure, is what is necessary if you are going to use what I call univariate software, which means all the Ys have to be in one column for this to work. So this is common if you have longitudinal data. This is also what it would look like by default if you have clustered data. So if you think about students nested in schools or something, each student would have a separate row of data. You wouldn't try to put them all on the same row with different column names. No one would try to do that. So this type of stack structure is um, inherent in some types of sampling designs. But when the unit of sampling is people, most of the time, naively, people will set the data up the way it is on the left. And I say don't do that. So if you're ever having to set up a data set and you know you're going to have repeated observations, make a row the lowest level of sampling because you know, you'll have far fewer variables. And as long as you've got a column to keep track of which is which, you're good. So, yeah. Summary would be one observation per person, multivariate structure to go provide, and more than one observation in the sense that it's repeated or um, like clustered, mm -hmm. then go for long. Yeah, so you can, you can get back and forth across data structures as needed in any package. Like, like these, there's reshaping commands to do that. It's just that path models or anything where you, you're treating each variable as a separate box, essentially, uses this wide structure. And to do like mix, like what we're going to do, or any of, the, like any of the software that we use up to this point, like Glimix, Mix, et cetera, we need this structure because there's only room for one Y. So they all have to share a column. And so this X variable is what it's going to end up doing is acting like a switch, where we're going to multiply predictors by X, and if X is 1, then it predicts this outcome, and if not, then it doesn't predict that one. So we'll have, like, multiple switches that pertain to each outcome column to, to set this up. Yes, it's confusing. <laughs> so if you're saying to yourself, what the hell is she talking about? Did she just contradict herself? Probably. Because the, the, the model is the model. How you get the software package to give it to you is a separate problem. And so there are certain situations in which it is more painful to do it one way versus the other. And there are some situations in which you can do it both ways. So we're starting with this long way because it lends itself to the same ideas and linear modeling strategies. But this long way is not going to work for most generalized outcomes because there's only one Y column. So, like, if I try to do a count model with a negative binomial, then I'm going to get a stretchy factor that's supposed to work equally well for time one and time two. There's no way to tell it to give me two of them. Whereas if I, if I keep it in separate columns like this in a path model, I can ask it for separate stretchy factors per column. So it comes down to fighting with software. <laughs> that's really what it comes down to. And I want you to have all the tools at your disposal to put up a good fight. All right. All right. And matrices next. Any questions on the data? Are we good with this? Okay. And I would say that when you're starting to store data, store it the long way. It's actually easier. Okay. So what if I had three people and two outcomes? This is what it would look like. So now I have changed my matrix notation and my scalar model notation to be IT. And this is opposite of what I do in longitudinal, but the reason I have it in this order is because I'm thinking of T as a multivariate uh, option. So I'm keeping it as the second subscript so that all of my examples are internally consistent. But for those of you who went through longitudinal already, it's TI in that class. So IT. So I have beta 0, 0, meaning that this is the intercept both with respect, with respect to any person level variables, which is the I, and with respect to any time level variables. X in this case is going to indicate which occasion is which for my two outcomes. So it's the first predictor with respect to time. That's why I have it as 01 in this way. And then EIT. And because I'm dealing with multiple observations per person, the way that it's usually expressed is by doing subject-specific matrices. So like here is what is predicted for my first person here. And each person would have the same little set. And the big difference is that how we tell it what to do with the E's that are in common for the same person. 
So we have a new term for this, as it is referred to in SAS output and a few other programs. I'm calling this the R matrix. R stands for residual. So we have to tell the program what to do with the E's from the same person. So our choice, our, our task, I should say, is to figure out which pattern is going to fit this best. And with only two occasions, there's not many, many choices here. I could say that the variance at time one is the same as the variance at time two, or I could let them be different. And I could say that, that there is a covariance between the ease at time one and the ease at time two, or I could force it to be zero. So there's not a lot of choices. The most generous thing you can do is allow the variance at time one to be a different number than the variance at time two, and then just allow the covariance to exist, and the best version of it will be estimated directly out of the data. So in explaining to the software that these two E's can't come from person one, and the next two E's come from person two, and the next two E's come from person three, in this sort of this structure, so we have two ID variables. Person keeps track of how the repeated observations are organized, and time within person keeps track of whether it's time one or time two, which is important if you have missing data. Then the, the full combined structure across participants has this form, which is known as block diagonal, where the data from the same person are like in a common chunk, and there's zeros everywhere else. Question? What happens if there's three uh, give me three slides and I'll show okay. you. <laughs> but the short answer, this little chunk is a three by three instead of a two by two. Okay. So this is saying that people share a common time one variance, they share a common time two variance, and they share a common covariance between time one and time two. And otherwise, they don't have anything in common. So the off diagonal off-block zeros here are still conveying the idea of independence. People should have nothing to do with each other, but the E's that come from the same person get to have this patterned relationship to them. So then the assumption that we're making about our model in the multivariate general linear model case is multivariate normal as opposed to just regular conditional normal. And that's where I think that I have the pictures coming. Yes, I do. Okay. It makes sense now. So because only some of the E's get to be related, right? Like this covariance isn't everywhere. It's just between the E's of the same person. It requires computing the log likelihood for each person, taking into account that they share these two observations. So we change the formula for height, instead of pertaining to one Y for each person, to hold as many Ys as they have. So these are pictures that I stole, and it was a long time ago, so I don't have references for them, of multivariate normal distributions where this is the likelihood in the third dimension here for height for an X and a Y that have nothing in common, so it's kind of like a big blob, like a circle. And this taco-looking thing here would be negative covariance. And positive covariance would be a taco in the opposite direction. It's like the, uh, it's like the traditional correlation graph, except you've like kind of made it 3D. Yep, somebody made it 3D. I didn't do this. It's, prob it's, prob it's probably Jonathan, to be honest, because if I didn't put where it came from, then I probably stole it from something he had done a long time ago. So the formula for height switches from univariate to multivariate. So the top line here is what it was for just a one observation GLM per person, and the bottom line is what it becomes when you go from one observation to multiple observations. So the switches, the most important thing is that rather than just having residual variance as one number right here, I have a matrix. My R matrix has the residual variance for each observation and their covariance in it. And then the other thing is that rather than having each individual Y minus Y hat, I've got the prediction for multiple Ys simultaneously given across these matrices here.
one thing to watch for is in these models it's not likely to happen, but once you get into random effects it can. You may see error messages about matrices going non-positive definite. If you see those words anywhere in your logs or output, it means your model is broken. That means that something became either redundant, like the correlation between Y1 and Y2 went over 1, for instance. If once, so its correlations are, have to be bounded, covariances are what are being estimated directly. Or um, that won't ha there's nothing else that would happen in this case. There's more things that can happen in other cases, but just this is something to watch for, that uh, if you have this, then it causes problems when you try to, to do matrix inversion, which is like division, and there's other chicanery that the program will then use to get your fixed effects out, but you shouldn't trust it. So not positive definite means broken. And that will be true in this class, that will be true in any of my multi-level classes, and that will be true in structural equation models. <laughs> All right, now missing data is coming up. So here's the bad news. A lot of people will say things like, well, maximum likelihood handles missing data. And handle is a word that people say when they don't know what they're talking about, and they've heard other people say it. Because if you ask, like, how does it get handled? It, it, it gets handled? What happens? I don't know. Well, here's what happens. It varies by software. In this type of long structure, the same rule is true as it was in the univariate case. Rows have to be complete to go into the model. The difference is what a row represents. A row is per outcome. So you can have somebody who came at time one, did not come back at time two, and you can use their time one observation if it's complete. So the good news is that whole people are not dropped if they're missing some outcomes. So this is going to be a better strategy than, say, a, a dependent samples t-test. That would have been one of the first things you learned back in intro stat a million years ago, right? There's a reason that I don't teach dependent samples t-tests in intermediate right now. I skipped anything due to repeated measures, and it's because of this. Because I don't want to give them techniques that are not going to work for most real world cases. Because if you have an analysis where people don't come back, like you have some kind of attrition, for instance, that is almost always gonna happen. And if you limit your analysis to just the people who started and finished your study, those are not a random subsample of who you started with. People who are diligent and able to complete a study are different than people who are not, most likely. So the goal of any kind of analysis involving maximum likelihood is to try to get back the parameter estimates that you would have had had the data been complete. That's the end goal. It relies on assumptions of missing at random, which we talked about last time, which is meaning that it is random only after conditioning on the information you do have. Another way of saying that is that like each person's log likelihood shape would be the same if you had all their data or only some of their data. So even though what we are using in, say, the mixed packages where we're starting with is full information maximum likelihood, which means it uses all the original data, it does not do anything about the missingness. It just allows you to use complete rows. But any person level predictors that are incomplete do kick out the whole people. So if you put in a person level covariate and you don't have it at all the occasions, then the whole person goes away. And that's not cool, but that is what happens. So there are two ways to deal with this. And for now, we're not going to deal with this. I will show how to deal with this in a couple more examples. There's basically two options. One is to pretend like your predictor is an outcome and introduce it into the likelihood. So that is what happens when we switch to path analysis by default in some of the packages and as an option to do in M plus as well. So in that case, then we can have missing data on a predictor if we are willing to make distributional assumptions about it the same as any other outcome. The other option is multiple imputation. 
So the missing data issue is more, more serious, I think, than most people understand. Because if you want to somehow use incomplete data on a predictor, you have to make distributional assumptions about it, either within a multiple imputation model or by treating it as an outcome in a maximum likelihood analysis. So there's no, there's no free, uh, free walks, free cakes, whatever the, the analogy is. Free rides? Let's go with that. Free something. Can't have your cake and eat it too. I don't know. I'm, I'm like mixing about seven metaphors together. But. I never got that though. You need to have your cake to eat. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't understand where that comes from. Because now that I actually analyze it linguistically, it doesn't make any sense. But what I want to, to say though is that that just because we're doing maximum likelihood, it doesn't handle missing data. Every row has to be complete. So <laughs> That's the rule. Yeah, to repeat again, uh, every row has to be complete in mm -hmm. the sense that uh, all the columns in that row need to have a value in them. Yep. And if there's not a value in one of the uh, rows, then that rows go, then does that row go away or does the whole version go away? Well, it depends on the level at which the information oh, is okay. missing. So if I'm missing one of the Ys, then I can still use the row that would be complete for the other one. But let's say that I put in something like a person's ethnic background and they don't want to answer that question. Oh, so, that's, yeah, that's missing. Yeah. That would be missing for every So it, it would be missing for all their occasions because you oh. don't have that information. That's the bad part. And they will get kicked out, and it's just like listwise deletion using least squares in that case. Okay, so if... Uh, Wait, no, I won't overcomplicate it. I got it. <laughs> yeah. So missing predictors are a big problem. Missing outcomes are less of a problem because you can use whichever ones you have. So strategies for missing predictors are multiple imputation or to treat the predictor as an outcome. And if you use Bayesian estimation, it sort of does a mix of both because it fills it in to be able to do each iteration but it fills it in with error, which is like a multiple imputation model. And yes, there should be a class on missing data in this program, and no, I will not be teaching it. <laughs> Ask someone else to do it. But it, it shows up in pieces across all of the classes that I do teach. So for now, you will see lines of code that select only complete cases for the analysis in, in all of our examples, so that we have the same observations contributing to the model regardless of which particular combinations of predictors I have in at the moment. Otherwise, if you don't do that, then you cannot do any kind of log likelihood comparisons because log likelihood is literally the sum across cases. And so if you have a model that has fewer cases than a different model, those log likelihoods are on different scales and they're not comparable. So this used to be... Um, a, an essay question back when I did a different type of homework was what if you add a predictor to the model and the predictor is not significant but the log likelihood goes down or the minus two log likelihood goes down a whole bunch. How could that be? Missing data is how that could be. If people have missing predictors they're not going to be included in the second model. The sum of the log likelihoods will be different as a consequence of those rows not being included. And if I can't use log likelihood, that means I can't use AIC, BIC, or anything that is derived from log likelihood either. All right. Um, yeah, Jonathan once told me a story of being at a conference where someone was talking about fitting a model to like three different data sets and the AIC was different across the data sets, and so they concluded that the model worked better in one of them than the others. And he was like, thunk. Face palm. No. That just means you have different data. All right. Where are we at? 130 already? My goodness. Good thing I made your homework due two days late. So, uh, Nathan, here's your answer. Three by three. So if I have now uh, three occasions per person, same exact thing, but now I have more choices to make. So I could either let each of these residual variances be the same or let them be different. 
and I could force these covariances to be the same or I could let them be different. And can you guess how we're going to choose what they should be? If we're making choices about what belongs in the model for the variance, can you think of something you've already learned that would help us decide that? Like, say, whether we need a stretchy factor or whether Poisson's good enough? The conditional distribution? Uh, that one is whether each is, is good per se, but whether one fits relatively better than another. Likelihood ratio. Likelihood ratio test, yes, indeed. So we can compare models that have different patterns to them and see which fits best. How would you make that, like, in the long form? Can you do that? Mm -hmm. You just have to do, like, another 0, 1 column? Uh, yeah, okay. exactly. Yep. That's what we're going to have. So there's a new line that's going to go into the code here. It's repeated in SAS mixed. It's random in SAS Glimix with the residual option. In Stata, there is going to be an option for residuals, and then you tell it how the residuals are organized. And in R, we're going to be using a routine called GLS, which stands for generalized least squares within the LME package. And we can tell it what kind of pattern for correlation and what kind of pattern for weights. For weights. So there are only a few different patterns that make sense to try with general multivariate data, there are many, many more when you're dealing with spatially organized data or temporally organized data. So basically we're looking at two things. Should the residual variances be different or the same? And should the residual covariances be different or the same? So here is the most obvious choice and the one that you'll be using in your next homework and the one that I'm using in my next example what is known as an unstructured matrix. And this is let the data do whatever it wants. I'm not going to force any kind of constraints with respect to the patterning. I'm going to let the residuals for outcome one have their own variance. The residuals for outcome two have their own variance. The residuals for outcome three have their own variance. I'm going to let each pair of outcomes have a different covariance and just let it be. So this is going to fit best because it will essentially recreate what's in the covariance matrix of the data if you had complete data. It will recreate what the covariance matrix would supposed to be if you have incomplete data under an assumption of missing at random. So this has, yep, okay, terminology coming up next. So this is a good idea whenever you don't have that many different outcomes, like two to three-ish. It's a bad idea when you have a lot. So let's say that you have a study with 10 different repeated measures conditions. If you wanted to fit an unstructured matrix for your residual variances and covariances, that would be 10 times 10 plus 1, which is 110, divided by 2, which is 55. So you would have 55 terms to estimate before you even get into building your model. At a minimum, that means you need 55 people. <laughs> but if you only have 55 people, you cannot estimate a 10 by 10 matrix with any level of precision. And generally speaking, if you try to estimate too much, that can cost you in terms of power. So we want to try to be parsimonious to the extent that the data are willing to cooperate with a simpler patterning to this. So in cases where you only have maybe two or three outcomes, I'd say just do this and leave it alone because you can't be wrong and there's not that many things you have to estimate. It's for more complex data where this may not be a great idea. This idea has a lot of synonyms. So the idea of unstructured, meaning let the residual variances and covariances be whatever they want, is also known as MANOVA. It is also known as the multivariate approach to repeated measures ANOVA which was like a footnote in my training um, in psychology. I learned back in the day when we were doing repeated measures ANOVA that there was a section on the SPSS output that was talking about like Greenhouse Geyser and Winfelt and a bunch of other old dead white guys who had tests for whether or not my matrix had sphericity. And if the test was significant, then it didn't have sphericity or 
and that meant I had to go look at a different section of the SPSS output. That's, that's my recollection of what was supposed to happen. What I now know is that there are two different versions of what people call repeated measures ANOVA. And this should sound familiar to those of you who've been through Longitudinal, or you'll get to hear about it this fall if you come hang out with me there. The univariate approach to repeated measures ANOVA forces all of the variances on the diagonal to be the same, and it forces all the covariances to be the same. That relates to an assumption of sphericity, but it's not quite the same thing. That pattern is known as compound symmetry. The alternative that is possible when doing least squares estimation is this unstructured where everything gets to be what it wants. So most folks I have come across do not understand this difference, and they fit models with com common variances and common covariances across conditions that are very different, and that is not a great idea. So this is what we refer to as the multivariate approach to repeated measures ANOVA. It is also has a special name. Those of you who've been through SEM, I know there's a few of you. Let's see, Andrea. Let's see, Farhan, you were in SEM, weren't you? No, you weren't. Okay, you're off the hook then. Who else? Okay, I know she, you're on the hook. You went through SEM with me. Who else was in there? Okay, Andrea, what is this? What's, What's your, your question? Can you repeat the question again? Yeah, what is this called in SEM class when we have an unstructured matrix? Um, it, sh it showed up on the M plus output with a special name. There's the name for sat saturated. Saturated? Okay. Yeah, this is the H1 model. I'll save that joke for another time. But this is the saturated model in SEM. It is the thing that all other factor models are compared against to judge how well they fit, because this is the right answer for the data. So it has a lot of synonyms. It shows up in a lot of different contexts. Uh, the big difference with respect to the ANOVA part of it is whether you're using least squares or not. If you're not, then you've got more choices. Question? Is this the, when testing companies hide the, the covariance matrices from <laughs> Uh I do not know how to answer that question. Okay. Um, Are they based on a simulation instead of the actual? Testing companies sometimes use simulation to come up with reliability estimates, okay. but that I think is a different context. This is how to represent the, the variance and covariance across multiple outcomes from the same person, and whether you let it be whatever it wants, which is this, or whether you force it to be a constrained pattern that is simpler to estimate, but potentially wrong. So this idea of unstructured describing a variance covariance matrix where every element gets to be whatever it wants shows up in like 13 different places across statistics under different names. So it is the saturated model, it is a MANOVA, and it is an unstructured matrix in this context. So the other choices then that make sense for multivariate data is compound symmetry heterogeneous or compound symmetry? So these are restrictions on the pattern. So compound symmetry heterogeneous says that there is a common correlation that underlies all three of the covariances and that the only reason that they would differ is because the variances differ. And compound symmetry, like I just said, is that there is a common correlation and a common covariance because the variances are the same. So compound symmetry is the univariate approach to repeated measures, the idea where each person is having themselves as their own control, represented as the compound symmetry part, and then the E variance is measure-specific residual variability also constrained to be equal across occasion, or occasions, outcomes in this context. So there are many other choices for multivariate settings where you have multiple observations in space or in time. There's lots and lots of choices for that, but we're not dealing with those in this class. So there's really only these three that would make sense. Uh, compound symmetry heterogeneous is not in state of mixed, and I'd have to look to see if it's in R somewhere. I think it is, if I remember correctly, from looking for this in longitudinal. So those are the other choices that we have. And likelihood ratio tests is how we'll choose among them. So unstructured is the most general model. Both of the others are nested in it. So if I have variance-covariance BC, which is the independence model, 
and compound symmetry fits better than that. That means I have some covariance across outcomes. I have compound symmetry within compound symmetry heterogeneous, and both of those are nested within unstructured. So then the conclusion you would draw from subsequent comparisons depends on which two models you're comparing. So for instance, the top versus the bottom, the difference is on the diagonal. Whether the diagonal has different residual variances across the outcomes or not, that's what the heterogeneous part means. And if UN fits better than CSH, then that means it's the co correlations that want to differ across outcomes as well. So we will, uh, yep, we will get a chance to see this at work in a couple of examples. For now, I'm, I'm skipping it because it's less important than getting used to doing the multivariate fixed effects. So, yeah. And then generally speaking, summarizing model fit. So in these models, we're going to be using residual maximum likelihood, which means we can't do likelihood ratio tests for anything involving fixed effects. That's why we do multivariate wall tests. We lump slopes together and get Fs or chi-scores for those. Anything involving model for the variance, we do do likelihood ratio tests instead. So this is just sort of a, a catch-all slide to clarify that as a concept. All right. There. 141. How are we doing? Yes, exhale. Big picture summary. We tell the software, these rows go with the same person, okay? Let them be correlated. The end. That's your big picture. How do you want them correlated? Let it do whatever it wants. It's unstructured, it's fine. Can't be wrong. If unstructured is too complex, you don't have a lot of people, you want to be more parsimonious, you can try these other options instead that have restrictions. They force the residual variances to be equal and or force the residual correlations to be equal. All right. Any questions before we call it a day then? Can I ask a question real quick? quick? Please. The Zoom. Yeah. Um, so no, I feel I like I'm pulling a fork on here, which is useful, useful and asking, asking <laughs> is my, my summary, summary correct? correct? <laughs> yes, go for it. Um, so I was I'm just looking at the, on your page 18, that, or not 18, 18, 18 um, 17, 17, that thing at the bottom about like the like, univariate versus random intercept, intercept only. only. Yep. Um, so the, it's the, the this, this is direct, like if we treat like the multivariate where we're looking at the relationship between outcomes in long format, that's direct. And it's and called, called indirect, indirect if we're using, using like a random intercept, intercept because, because it just, it just like, like the difference between fixed effects and random intercepts with a random intercept, intercept we're, we're not like getting, getting like, like a, a we're, we're just inter, inter, we're just we're just uh, 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 estimating like the, the, the variance for that random intercept, intercept. Uh, not like slopes, slopes for example yeah Partially right. So I call it direct because we're allowing the relationship between outcomes to happen between the E's only. So the E's are part of a multivariate normal distribution that has a set variance covariance pattern to it. The indirect is when we say the E's are independent because we've moved their correlation to a different matrix. Okay. And we put it in there and it's the G matrix and that's a random intercept instead. Okay, okay, and this is direct, direct. It's, we're, we're just, just looking, looking at the R matrices. matrices. Okay, okay, I get it. Yeah, here's some uh, foreshadowing. This. This is slide 20. So the top okay. is, a is a direct pattern where it's the compound symmetry pattern, and this is among the E's, whereas the indirect is, no, we take the, that CS thing and we stick it someplace else, and that goes over here, and but it still has the same pattern when you put it back together again. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Yep. So the big difference is that this indirect bottom section that we'll do on Thursday, I think, or whenever we get to it, is the only option when you don't have normal data. Because we don't have residual variances that we can decide to be different or the same, and we don't have residual covariances if we don't have residual variances. So the only way to let the, to build in the correlation across outcomes, if you have generalized models, is to do it this way instead, which is this random intercept thingy, which you probably have seen before, because that's what is in repeated measures ANOVA and the beginning of mixed effects models. So, 
It is also related conceptually, for those of you who've been through SEM, you can think of this as like the basis of a bifactor model, where you have a separate factor that is building in an additional source of correlation instead of a residual covariance in the model. It's a random intercept factor if you constrain all the loadings to be equal. So all this tie across all the disciplines. Anywho, it's 145. It's garbage day. That means I say, thanks for coming. See you Thursday. Let me know if you need anything. Peace out. <laughs>